Hey everybody, recently Alien Space had the opportunity to interview Polaristan Commander Jarek Isaacman, and I was able to be part of that interview process. Now, Ellie has already put out her video. It is here linked at the bottom of the screen and the video description. I recommend you take a look at hers. But I had a chance to ask him some additional questions that were not included in her video, so I thought I would put out this video, and I think you'll find it quite interesting. You know, met with Elon, and we talked about what the Polaris program could be from a, you know, like a test and developmental perspective. We thought the objectives of Polaris Dawn would be split into two missions, and um, you know, he was like, "No, let's just let's just combine them," and um, and that. Uh, you know, that just meant there was a lot that needed to get done. Jared Isaacman is the mission commander for the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission. It will be SpaceX's 14th crewed flight to space. So far, they've had 13 crewed missions, both for NASA and even commercial customers. Polaris is gearing up for a high altitude crewed Dragon flight that will perform several firsts, including the first all civilian spacewalk, which will test out the new spacesuit design in the vacuum of space. We've been just in, I mean, near continuous training the last couple months. Uh, so I'm, I'm in Hawthorne now. Uh, we just uh, finished up some suit testing. We'll be here through the weekend and, and into next week as well. So there's a lot to get done. Um, and I think the idea is by the time Polaris is complete and Starship's operational, well, maybe, you know, SpaceX has learned a little bit more um, to help them in their, their big goals. Uh, this is uh, Joe Tegmaier again off screen, but uh, kind of going back with that theme of the Gemini uh, program. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> hey. Uh, but, uh, you know, the spacesuits that you're having right now is kind of the first iteration of an EDA. It's tethered. Um, you know, it has some limitations. But do you see this as the only use of this and then iterate beyond this? Or do you see further use of this particular EVA suit? Oh, I, I mean, I'm I. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that the, you know, the, the block 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 upgrades are already roadmapped out. Um, you know, at some point or another, you kind of have to lock in your current design and say, this is what we got and we're going to learn from it. But I, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think they will ever use these suits again. I think they will take the data from this and help ensure that what they have right with the 1.5 or 1.6 is correct. But I mean, I think, you know, SpaceX wants to move in the direction of what you see in the movies of basically I can throw on the helmet and run outside, not have to do a pre-breathe, you know, so that's probably higher pressures, um, you know, more mobility, which is a challenge with higher pressures, you know, obviously a, a portable life support system, which I don't think is that, um, I don't think that's like one of the bigger engineering challenges. Um, I think having a suit that's, you know, uh, reasonably low cost where they could make it for lots of people. And that has a lot of move, a lot, lot of flexibility, um, and, uh, great dexterity on the fingers at high pressure. So you can minimize pre-breathe is a, um, is a big objective is the ultimate objective, I'd say. Right. And not just pre-breathing, but also just the mobility because, you know, uh, a space is basically a giant balloon and the more you inflate it, the harder it is to move around. So, yeah. You know, and I, I just I hope that people understand that what you're doing is, you know, that iterative process. You know, some people look at the suit and they say, well, that's great, but it's, you know, it's like Gemini or whatever. But this is just the first step of many and you have to get the data. And the only way you get the data is to actually fly with it. Yeah, I you're, well, you're 100 percent. I mean, there's just I mean, unfortunately, what I've just kind of learned about, you know, the old space and the new space is, is that um, if you kind of go into it with a if you're pretty entrenched in your position, Mm -hmm. um, you will find something to dislike about everything that, you know, one company does versus the other, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, what SpaceX has done with their suit is pretty incredible. It, it I mean, it operates, you know, at a, a much higher pressure than the EMU suits, um, which reduces, you know, pre-breathe requirements. And um, uh, it has great mobility, great dexterity with the fingers. I mean, but, it, you know, it is a, a, a version 1.0, but they've solved for, you know, a lot of thermal yeah, issues with it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's got redundancy in it for different life support uh, for for two different you know oxygen channels. So they've done an awful lot to get to this point of learning, and they're going to keep they're going to keep going from here. Um, it doesn't like we can be impressed with the accomplishment and the the dollars that they've invested to get us to this point without it necessarily being like a 
uh, a comparison to the EMU or what was done 60 years ago. It's just, it's all in the direction of goodness right now. I ask you a question about that. Uh, you know, when you did Inspiration 4, you were kind of the rookie along with the rest of the crew members and you were experiencing it for the first time all together. This time you're the experienced guy. So what's that going to be like with three rookies with you? <laughs> I, I, uh, I think this is the, I think this is hands down the best dragon crew yet. Um, I mean, you've got so many knowledgeable people. I mean, you know, Sarah Gillis, lead astronaut trainer of SpaceX trained all the NASA crews who hold, held her in such high regard. She trained the inspiration for crew, uh, trained me to go to space. Um, you know, she's a core in mission control. So, you know, she's the Capcom plus an engineer in that role. So incredibly knowledgeable. Anna Menon was the, you know, as a mission director by day, um, you know, she runs mission control. And uh, she's also an engineer that designed a lot of the contingency procedures that are available in Dragon that we're going to use nominally, like bending the vehicle down on purpose. Um, and she's a medical officer and she was the family liaison for Inspiration4. Um, you know, that SpaceX embedded with the families to kind of translate the technical things that were going on. You know, Kid Poteed, great pilot. I've known him forever, served the country really well uh, in a number of leadership roles, including as a Thunderbird. Um, you know, he's, uh, you know, incredible, just incredibly talented pilot. Like we just have such an awesome group and we trained together for, for so long um, that, uh, you know, I don't think there's, I have some minor tidbits of, uh, little things on, you know, efficient ways to brush your teeth and sleep and, you know, what you should expect to feel. And, um, you know, I, I've seen firsthand kind of space adaptation syndrome. So I, 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 I can add a little bit of value, but um, there, there's far smarter people on this mission uh, than myself going up. So. Did, did you experience a lot of that space adaptation syndrome? Uh, how we did. How it to the lay person? Yeah. Um, so this is super important, you know, um, obviously a big SpaceX fan and everything that they're trying to accomplish, but they can't solve all the problems related to, you know, making us a spacefaring civilization. Like they're, they're working on the vehicles. Um, there's a lot more to it. Like there's the very real reality that 50% plus of people when you arrive on orbit are going to feel horrible. Um, and it's been like that. It doesn't matter. You know, the most hardcore fighter pilots in the world, um, it has very little to do with like your susceptibility to motion sickness on earth. There's a number of things that could contribute to it, including those fluid shifts, that intracranial pressure could be a factor, but you'll feel terrible. So, you know, if Starship is the 737 of space flight, imagine being on a Southwest flight and half the people are throwing up on board. The, the, they feel terrible. And then the other half of the people feel, feel terrible, right? Yeah. So this has been the reality through all of human space flight. And um, the odds were no different on uh, Inspiration4. We had 50% of the crew members that were on well. And um, there's great medications for it. They don't work super well in advance of flight. Um, but you can, there's kind of some gold standard shots of like fenugrin that, um, you know, eight hours later, you're, you know, you're back in business. Um, so <laughs> super real, but I mean, you think about everything else, there's, uh, no one's done any, you know, surgery in space. There's no childbirth in space. There, there's so many, there's tons of psychological things. So, you know, there's a lot of things to solve through so many different career paths that are going to be important if we're ever, you know, kind of truly a multi-planetary species. You know, I haven't heard anybody ask you this, but have you looked back at your Inspiration4 mission and compared how you physically looked before the launch and in orbit? I mean, you you definitely had a lot more fluid that was in your, your body and your physical changes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, we're, we're, you know, we, we kind of get that in like uh, the, you know, physiology 101 and human, you're going to just have puffy face. It's the chipmunk yeah. thing. There's nothing... <laughs> nothing you can do the, the fluid kind of without gravity the fluid's just going to shift upwards interestingly we do have one of our experiments is a blood flow restriction uh cuffs that basically they're like gym shorts but um they just uh choke the hell out of the blood flow in your legs and like um, you too. <laughs> yeah yeah it, it 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 is but on uh but like 20 times worse, uh, yeah. like 50 times worse. I mean, it really feels like, you know, you're like, are you sure this is good for me? Yeah, um, I tell you, wearing a G-suit, I was flying 38s, and that is not fun when that thing inflates. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm sure I could pull 20 Gs with this thing on. but um, <laughs> Don't it's, try uh, that. <laughs> yeah. 
the Russians have been doing it apparently for a while, but um, not collecting data from it. Yeah. And it apparently has helped with their, um, you know, their acclimatization, I guess, if you will, of our acclimation to, uh, to space. So we, we are trying that as a way. And so maybe we'll have slightly less puffy faces. I'm not sure. <laughs> wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. One last question real quick is speaking of that and the Russians and their first experiences with EVAs, one of the biggest issues that they had was the suit overinflated. They had a hard time getting back in. What have you guys done to address that? And what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very, very familiar with that. I think we're in good shape. We, um, you know, Dragon's got a very, uh, very big um, forward hatch. So I think even if the thing went really crazy and overinflated, we'd be totally fine there. We do have uh, abilities to vent down, which they, they did have to do in that, that circumstance. Um, I don't that, like that, it, that. That is for other contingencies. I don't think we'll have any problem getting back inside uh, the vehicle just based on the size of the size of the hatch. And we've had a hundred runs, um, you know, in the simulator under a offload system, um, going in and out of the hatch, closing the hatch, um, in all sorts of contingencies. So I feel it pre and fully pressurized. So I feel really good about that. Well, it's, it's extremely exciting and, you know, hopefully we can make it to the launch. <laughs> very exciting. Great. We're very, we're very excited and thank you. You've given amazing responses. So, uh, really thank you for your time. I think it's awesome that you're, uh, you know, keeping people educated and informed. It's, uh, this is what we're all pretty passionate about. So I think it's very important. <laughs> Great. Well, well, thank you. Good luck. Thank yep. Thank you. So that wraps up some of the additional questions that I had for Jared, and I hope that you found that helpful and informative, especially considering what the Polaris program is trying to do and the upcoming mission in July. I want to say thank you very much to Jared for taking the time to answer our questions and also to Alien Space for inviting me along to be part of the interview. I do hope that you found this informative and helpful, and thank you very much for your support.